So Steve, Stephen, um, you know, you just got through telling us about going through that initial chemo and then the maintenance therapy for two years uh, with Rituxan. And then you were good to go. Um, your oncologist had said, we're gonna buy you as much time as possible. And so years go by. How are you, by the way, living life? I know you had follow-up, right? How, how, how many times were you having to see your oncologist? Every three months. Excuse me, for the last 15 years, essentially, you know. Yeah, right. And in that time frame, so even though. Well, let, me, let me let me clarify. Every three months, as long as things were OK. Right. So any time where there was the least little bit of a hiccup. Right. It could be a month. It could be six weeks where he'd say, I, I want to check your blood again in, in, in one month. Come back. So three right. months is what we hope for. Right. It's never any longer than that. I think every once in a while I'll bargain for four months. He'll joke with me when I leave and I'll say, when do you want to come back? And I'll say, six months. I'll say, okay, I'll see you in three. It's not a negotiation. <laughs> right, but right. He says it anyway, like, like it is. <laughs> Rhetorical question, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so actually, I'm glad you brought that up because you did have all these years and you were good. Although when the numbers started to not look so great, let's say your white blood cell counts maybe started to go up again, you did mention there would be steroids that would be used. So it wouldn't be, let's throw you back into another treatment. It would be, um, dexamethasone or prednisone, right? Can you can you talk about that? Yeah, so that was always the um, the go to band aid when things would start to escalate a little bit, but not to the point of needing full full board treatment, right? It was white count is or your your lymph nodes are starting to flare up again. We got some swelling. We did a we did a MRI. We were seeing some things. It's not worth going through putting your body through full treatment but let's just let's just try to get a handle on it with some of the prednisone high doses of prednisone or high doses of whichever prednisone or, or decadrone on the interim basis and, and hopefully that'll maybe knock it off the grid or or just see how we do from there so i've been through a number of rounds of both of those drugs over time and i've developed a love-hate relationship with both of them um, prednisone and decadron. Probably hate decadron more and love prednisone more, but that's just me. What's the love hate part of it? The love hate is I totally recognize the benefit and I and I see how well it works. But it's the kind of thing where I'm on decadron for a couple of days and I wake up with, or no, I don't wake up because I don't sleep. So so I, I'm awake throughout the night with enough energy to build a house. And then at some point during the day, I start to bonk and I don't know what to do with myself. And then I crash. And then I'm, I'm all mixed up. My cycles are mixed up. I get a little cranky. I get a little, it's got, it, they all come with a price tag, right? Um, but they work tremendously well. So you have to just, you have to just accept the whole package, right? If you're going to accept the treatment, you need to accept what comes along with it. Do you have any tips for people? Because steroids are, you know, in a lot of different regimens for people, no matter what kind of cancer. And so um, any tips on how to deal with the ups and the downs that steroids bring? The emotional ups and downs, other than sticking with, and I refer to this as eating chocolate. And, and by that, I mean, I don't mean a, a, a Hershey cocoa product, but I mean, those things in life that make you feel really good and make your eyes roll in the back of your head and you say, that's delicious. Whatever that is for you, if it's needlepoint or, or gardening or bird watching or running marathons or whatever it is, if you, can, if you can keep up some level of something that makes you feel really good about yourself, that's gonna help offset any kind of emotional stress that any of this stuff is putting on your, on your body. As far as the physical stuff goes, again, it's a cycle. You're going to stay awake. <laughs> um, and that one thing I learned very early on in my, in my triathlon and, and marathon running days, <clears throat> you're probably not going to sleep very well the night before a race. It's just a given. So stop putting pressure on yourself that you need to fall asleep immediately. And you're going to, you're going to stare at the ceiling and you're going to toss and turn. And it's the same thing on Decadron, right? I'm not going to sleep tonight. So I'm going to rest. I'm going to have my feet up. I'm going to relax. I'm going to put on, I'm going to read. I'm going to put on some relaxing music. I'm going to do something that will 
help level me out even if I don't sleep soundly. And, and that's typically the kind of rest that will at least get you through for a little while anyway. And I know you've addressed this, you know, but just one more time on the fact that you'd have to get these, again, at best three months apart follow-ups, right? Living life sort of in these three month intervals, if you will, do you have, you know, any tips for people on that and how you were able to, to get through that over a period of years and still? <clears throat> you say that, <clears throat> excuse me, you ask that question like that's a negative, like that's a negative that one has to get over. How about you flip it and you say, I'm fortunate enough to be tightly tethered to my oncologist that every three months I know the state of my health and not everybody walking the planet can say that. So, and that's how, I, that's how I chose to view it, that I, I'm safe. And, and, and if, if I, he, if he were to say to me, come back next year, I would say, wait, what? <laughs> no, <laughs> I need, I need to see you sooner than that. Cause I need to make sure that, I, that just because I feel okay, that you need to tell me that I'm okay. You know? I love that. And, you know, we usually talk about this uh, in the very last sort of segment or whatever, when we talk about quality of life, but, and we will dive into this again too, Stephen, but survivorship, people talk about that. It's like the great part of being in the treatment is having that close relationship yeah. with your doctor, you know, and feeling like someone's watching and taking yeah. care of you. And so I love that. You're right. It's flipping that question around. It's not a negative. Um, and so, you know, let's talk about that. You know, you, you do this and about six, seven years later, those symptoms you are feeling, they get to the point where they feel like that first time around, um, it gets bad enough to where you're like, okay, steroids may or may not be helpful. And that's when the Bendeca or Bendamustine came in. So can you talk, take us back to that point and what the doctor said, what your doctor told you about what needed to, to happen? <clears throat> sure, yeah, he, I mean, I get, like you said, symptoms started to, to reappear, recur, same, same types of problems, difficulty swallowing, lymph nodes. Um, this time I was experiencing some, some night sweats, some other classic symptoms. He just didn't want to venture down the same path because um, he felt like we had already gotten our money's worth out of that previous treatment. And there were so many other really good things in the pipeline and it already in, in flight that he wanted, to, he wanted to venture down that road. So he was the first person to bring up Bendeca. And, and, I, and I will also tell you that every appointment, we will talk about what's, what's coming, what's in the pipeline. Hey, have you heard about the new, the new son of Ibrutinib, the new next generation Ibrutinib, or the grandson of Ibrutinib? Or the, you know? So I kind of have a little bit of an understanding of some of the things that are coming. Um, and so when he said Ben Deck is probably the next logical, I, I, you know, I had full faith in him at this point and I, I was willing to, to take the leap with him. And yeah, there's my good old little port shining. That's right. Loud and clear. <laughs> yes, you can see it very clearly. Yeah. And, and as we wrap this segment, before we get into the targeted therapy, and I'm so glad you brought up Ibrutinib and what you're on right now, um, but to finish this part of it. So he, then he said, okay, so Bendeca or Bendamustine, and we're going to do this for a year, or, you know, you need a port. This is not the IV chemo. Um, can you just sort of summarize the, that one year on Bendamustine and on, with a port? <laughs> yeah, it wasn't even a full year that I was on. Bandeca, um, it was four, it was four weekly cycles. Um, and we didn't even get all the way through the fourth because my white count, or my, my blood work overall had kind of plummeted after about three and a half. So we ended up not finishing that fourth. But I think in many cases that fourth, that fourth cycle is um, at the, at the oncologist's discretion, you know, based on what are the results, how are you feeling, what are we seeing? And he, he had seen enough, you know, the results were pretty definitive that we're, we're getting the response we need. There's no need to put you through this for another few sessions. Let's just pull the plug now. So I kept the port in for a couple of months while we made sure that it was gonna remain at bay, which it did for a few months. And then I was, I was the first one to say, can we please take this thing out? Because it was, 
I just I was conscientious about it, and I you know it doesn't look exceptionally big, but when you know what's there and you know what doesn't belong there, it just it made me feel kind of awkward. You felt uh, foreign, right? Like this is not a part yeah, of me. Quick funny story about that though. I I was on the operating table having it removed. Same doctor took it out to put it in, um, and I. And at the time I felt, hey, this little device that's inside me was was very, very powerful, delivered what it needed to deliver and helped put me in a good place. So I was only in a little bit of a little bit of mild twilight for this procedure with some some uh, local anesthesia. Or yeah, it's just some some numbing on my chest. So the doctor's getting ready to go in and I said, I have a favor. Can I have that when you take it out? <laughs> and he said, what? And he said, can I have that when, when you take it out? He said, you want your port? You want your dirty port from inside your body? And I said, uh -huh. I want to I take it home. I want to put it in my trophy cabinet. And he said, there's, there's strict hospital policies about that, you know? Well, I said, yeah, okay, I guess. Well, next thing I know, I hear him, he's finishing up and I hear him turn to one of the nurses in the room and he said, would you please take this thing, go clean it up over there, put it in this vial, slide it under his sheet, and mom's the word. So that's what we did. I have my port. It's in my, I think it's in my cabinet over there. It's, it's, it's here somewhere. And I, I, cause I just thought it was, it was another chapter in the story, right? It was the, it was the, you know, when I can do little crazy things like that, it makes me feel as though I'm one step ahead of the disease because I'm kind of almost mocking it, if you will. <laughs> Yeah, no, I love that. And you're pioneering. You're like, my voice is the yeah, loudest right. in this room. Yeah. I'm going to yeah. do what I want. And I see here too, as part of the um, Bendeka treatments, you have your oldest daughter here, That's right? right. That's Jennifer? Jennifer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. how, how important is it through this process to have, you know, the support uh, and, and caregivers? So that's a very loaded question. For me, it was critical. Um, for me, it was important that I had loved ones nearby. That might not, you might not get the same answer from everybody that you speak to because some people just prefer to live this more privately. And I'm not advocating that anyone go through it in a complete vacuum, 100% by themselves. But I'm one end of the spectrum. I was very public about this. I continue to be very public about it. I will climb to the highest mountain and preach about what I went through, how I did it, how, how we can advocate together, how I can help others. But then there are some people who say, look, I just wanna show up, get my treatment, go home, not talk about it. And you have to be respectful of that too. So I don't think there's any, there's any standard formula for how this all has to work, but I think it's really important that everyone at least has someone that they can talk to um, and, and maybe it's family, maybe it's a professional, maybe it's a faceless person through one of the organizations that, that partner patients and mentors, you know, because then they become kind of faceless and they can offer some advice and, and some, some help in that respect. But again, everybody needs somebody, but to, to varying levels and, and right. no two people are the same with that. 100%. No two people are the same or track the same or have the same experience. But, you know, in, in sharing your story, Stephen, you're allowing people to find it and be helped by it. So I, I really appreciate that. Um, and I, you know, um, I, I love that you were able to bring us through. I mean, this is years of, of you know, the treatment and the follow up. Um, any last thing you want to say before we shift over to the targeted therapy experience? Um, actually, the, my last question would be, when you know you'd gone through this it hadn't been a year the results were looking good but this was not your first time going through treatment how did it feel different than the first time that you'd gone through chemo did it feel any different hearing the doctor say okay good the numbers look good and you should be all right i mean it felt different only that it was a different method you know of drug transport i mean i just feel like it was I said it before, a, a different chapter of the story. It was, it was a little different. I don't think my body necessarily felt any different or responded any differently. I think the whole routine became different. 
but I just thought that was part of the evolution of treatment. You know, this, this Bendeca wasn't an option when I was first treated. Then it was, so we moved on to that. And then at some point we move on to the next thing when the time is right. 